is Natalie Winchell. I'm going to have her introduce herself. This is an uh, interesting project. She expanded on it a little bit that I really appreciated. So go ahead. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Um, thank you for inviting me to come talk today. As Rosie said, the the topic was pretty broad. There's a lot that you can discuss with drugs and um, illicit substances. I specifically work um, for Olmstead Medical Center in treatment. So I'm going to talk a little bit about that and how um, medications for substance use disorder work. Um, just a little bit more about me. I am a Cannon Falls resident. My husband and I both graduated from Cannon Falls High School. Um, after high school, I went to the University of Minnesota. I spent eight years there. I have a bachelor's degree in biology, and then I got my doctorate in pharmacy. Uh, we have four kids. Uh, we enjoy going to sporting events. Um, we go to a lot of bomber sporting events, and um, as well as some gopher sporting event events as well. After I graduated pharmacy school, I started working at Olmstead Medical Center. So I've been there for six and a half years. I've worked in different um, roles as a pharmacist, but for the last four and a half years, I have been the uh, operations manager for the hospital pharmacy, as well as our infusion therapy center, and then our medication assisted treatment clinic, which is what I'm gonna talk about today. Uh, if you're not super familiar with Olmstead Medical Center, which I've talked to a few, a few of you here um, just about where we have clinics and uh, the types of services we offer. Uh, so this chart right up at the top there shows the different towns where we have a clinic. So Cannon Falls has um, an Olmstead Medical Center clinic. Uh, we have 11 branch clinics in total throughout southeastern Minnesota. Um, and then just some of the other data of we have over 35 clinical specialties. Um, so if you're not familiar with some of the specialties that we have, I'm, I'm happy to talk about it and see, you know, if we have a service that would meet your needs. Um, what else? And we are going to be opening a new location in 2025 in Owatonna. So we're kind of continuing to branch out our, our service locations. Um, we do a lot of work within Olmstead County and I, I personally um, and am, am involved with a lot of different committees and organizations within Olmstead County. Um, but one of our goals for this year is to reach out to the other communities that we serve to see what their needs are and how OMC can meet those needs. So what I wanted to go through today is just go, doing an overview of some of the data specific to Goodhue County on substance use and overdose. Um, we'll review what medication assisted treatment is and what services we provide at the clinic in Rochester. Um, we'll go into detail a little bit about how the medications for substance use disorder work. Um, and then talk about some of the changes that have um, happened in the last year um, from the legislature, because there's been quite a few. I do just want to give a quick acknowledgement. Um, some of the data that you'll see came from a Goodhue County uh, needs assessment that was recently conducted by another Cannon Falls resident, Laura Prink. Uh, she was consulted by Goodhue County Public Health to do a needs assessment on what the opioid crisis is in Goodhue County. Um, if you've heard about it in the news, there's the opioid settlement, which is the lawsuit with the pharmaceutical manufacturers and some of the other large companies that contributed to the opioid crisis. Um, so the state will be getting funds over the next 18 years. Um, and those funds will be going to the counties and be able to be used to help um, provide more resources and um, care for in, and prevention for um, substance use disorder. So I just, this, her, she finished the report, I think in December, so this is pretty new. Um, and then the next steps that the county will take is to see what um, action items they want to take um, from that needs assessment. All right, so this slide, it might be a little bit hard to see some of the data, but I, I'll go through it. Um, so this is data specific to Goodhue County. 
Um, we, our county has identified substance use as one of our top community health needs. Um, and that it goes along with housing, um, mental health services, and then substance use is the number three community health need. Uh, so you can see some different statistics here. So 34% of adults 25 and older report binge drinking within the past 30 days. Um, we have seen an increase in overdose deaths that include synthetic op opioids. Um, and we have about 6% of G Goodhue County 11th graders that have reported using prescription drugs without a prescription um, or inappropriately. So let's see here. This also has some additional data, and I think sometimes, you know, there's this mentality that, well, it's not happening here, right? Or we don't see it here, but you hear about it in the news, it's happening in the cities. Um, but what I found really interesting from the Goodhue County Needs Assessment is that we actually have one of the highest rates of um, deaths by drug overdose in southern Minnesota. And so that's comparing our county to Dakota County, Olmstead County, all the surrounding areas, um, and we actually have one of the higher rates. Uh, and that could be, that doesn't necessarily mean we have more drugs in Goodhue County. It could just mean that we lack some of the additional resources that some of these other areas have. Um, so this top graph here is the number of non-fatal overdose. Um, so we've seen an increase in that and we have data through 2021 and this is specific for opioid overdose. Um, and then the bottom graph there is overdose deaths uh, and we have preliminary, preliminary data through 2022 um, that hasn't been finalized yet because it does take, there's about a two year delay in getting that data. Um, and again, opioids was the most common substance involved in the overdose deaths. The uh, age range for, uh, the, the biggest age range for overdose deaths is the 25 to 34 year old age range. Um, and then the second highest was the 15 to 24 year old age range. This data shows what adolescent um, drug use looks like. Uh, so every three years, there's the Minnesota Student Survey, which goes out to all Minnesota students. Um, they are surveyed on a ton of different questions and it's all self-reported. Um, so there is a subset of questions specific about drug use. Um, and there's a lot of data, but I just pulled out a couple relevant things. Um, so, the survey is conducted every three years, so it was just recently conducted in 2022. Um, and when s surveying 8th, 9th, and 11th graders, um, we have seen that the percentage of students reporting inappropriate use of pain medications has increased. Um, and so the um, first graph there shows the overall st state data for Minnesota. And then this graph right here is specific to Goodhue County. So we're seeing about 5% of our students in Goodhue County reporting that they've used a pain medication that either wasn't prescribed to them or using it differently than how it was intended to be used. Um, and again, I just wanna highlight that we are surveying eighth graders with that, so pretty young. Um, and so some of the some of the efforts and focus that different organizations have is on youth prevention and really um, talking to youth younger and, and making sure they're aware of risks um, of using, inappropriately using those medications. I wanted to include this slide on xylazine. So this has been in the news recently. Um, it is being included in um, illicit substances, so opioids like fentanyl, um, and it's actually a veterinary sedative. So the reason why it's being added, added to, me, to opioids is that it slows down the effects. So fentanyl is a very quick, quick acting um, and it doesn't last very long. So by adding the xylazine, they, the intent is that you get a longer effect. 
Um, but the downside of that is there is a higher risk for overdose and death because it will, it causes that respiratory depression or where um, you're not breathing. Uh, this chart right here shows what counties in Minnesota have had a xylazine related overdose death. Um, we haven't had one reported in Goodhue County, but you can see that the neighboring counties have had um, reported overdose deaths. Um, so, yeah. Why those particular counties? Um, I think it, I would say that that probably comes from where we see the high drug trafficking areas and, and where those, um, where illicit substances come into our communities. Um, so Rochester, the Twin Cities, and then from there it kind of disperses. Um, but those seem so remotely located. I can see the Twin Cities. Yep. I'm from the Twin Cities. Yep. I love them, but yeah. there's problems. But those other two is... And you also, we, so we, um, in northern Minnesota, um, in some of the reservations, there's a high high rate of substance use up there. So definitely needed, needed resources. Um, and so Narcan or naloxone is typically what is used to reverse an, an overdose. And unfortunately, it's not effective against xylazine. Um, so we still give it and, and you know, that's kind of the only um, first line treatment we can provide is administering the naloxone and it'll reverse the effects of the opioids that might be on board, um, but we don't have a reversal for xylazine. Um, when I was putting together this presentation, I used a lot of resources from the Minnesota Department of Health, and they have a lot of information out there. And what I learned is that we actually have um, test strips available that those that use illicit substances can actually test their sample before using to see if it's contaminated with xylazine. Um, obviously, our, our hope would be that they wouldn't be using substances, but um, from a, a harm reduction, so preventing potential death, um, we do ha there are test strips available that can test the substance to see if it's contaminated or not. Um, I do have fentanyl test strips here, which I, I can show you guys um, after the presen presentation as well, but that was new to me um, that we also have xylazine test strips as well. Where would somebody go to get those test strips and would they go because they'd be admitting that they were on drugs? Yep, yeah, and that's a good question. And um, as I mentioned, the, the Department of Health has a lot of those resources of where you can find um, test strips and, and most nonprofit organizations will have them free of charge. Um, so I'll share some of those resources at the end. So now I'll talk a little bit more about um, medication-assisted treatment um, and what that is. So MAT is the acronym. Um, you might also hear MOUD, which stands for Medications for Opioid Use Disorder. Um, so it's the use of prescribed medications in combination with recovery activities, behavioral therapy, counseling, um, to treat the substance use disorder. So it provides um, an opportunity for patients to start recovery and not experience cravings and withdrawal. Um, really gives them an opportunity to participate in some of the other recovery activities um, without, going, without experiencing those negative effects of um, withdrawal. So Olmstead Medical Center, we started the MAT Clinic in 2020. Um, I've, I've been the manager of the MAT Clinic since we started. Um, initially, we started the clinic based off of a grant that we got, again, due to the opioid crisis. Um, and when we started, we had three staff members. Um, we had a nurse practitioner that helped to develop the practice, um, as well as some nurses, and then me as the supervisor. Um, we quickly, as soon as we opened the clinic, we realized that there was just such a need within the community. Um, so we quickly added additional staff and we currently now have three nurses um, as well as four clinicians. And the clinicians um, are, include two MDs and then also two physician's assistants. Um, and they, they share their time with family, some of the providers share their time with family medicine as well. Um, 
and then I am still the supervisor for the MAC clinic. We currently treat 200 patients um, in the clinic and we've recently just increased the providers that we have in the clinic. So now we have additional um, appointments available for more patients to be seen to get started on treatment. We also participate in a lot of different community organizations. Um, one of those is Tackling Overdose with Networks. So we participate with a, a bunch of other organizations throughout Minnesota um, to talk about how we're addressing um, substance use and we, you know, if there's um, new substances that we're seeing in the area and um, new data or research on uh, treatment. Um, we, within Olmstead County, we do participate with the um, Corrections and Olmstead County Jail um, and Police Assisted Recovery. Um, Police Assisted Recovery is a collaboration with law enforcement and some of the other local organizations. Um, so when we have individuals that have a uh, police involved incident um, and they say they want to get treatment, um, we actually have some treatment facilities within Rochester that have beds reserved for um, those individuals. And so we have that connection um, with law enforcement and the treatment community to get more individuals into treatment. Some of the different services that we provide in the MAT clinic. So as mentioned, we provide um, medication options for opioid use disorder, alcohol use disorder, and also nicotine dependence. Um, a lot of times what we see is that individuals have co-occurring or multiple substances, so it might be alcohol, alcohol and opioids. Um, it could be opioids and cocaine. You know, we see a lot of overlap. Um, so, you know, it, it's, a, it's a process of we try to address um, what we have treatments for. There's some substances that we don't have treatment for. Um, and then by getting control of maybe one of the substances, um, then maybe they can participate in additional uh, recovery activities to help um, reduce or eliminate those other substances. We also will do opioid and benzodiazepine tapering. So um, those are both substances that can be, that are prescribed for for purposes, um, but they do have the risk of dependence um, and wanting to taper patients off of those. Um, and then for patients that have maybe had substance use disorder or who need to um, have surgery, obvi obviously there's certain instances where opioids are an appropriate treatment. If you're having a, a major surgery, you're gonna be in a lot of pain and, and opioids might be the best treatment. Um, but we, it's a balance of uh, how do we manage that and making sure there's good communication with um, all of your providers, with the anesthes anesthesiologists. Um, so we make recommendations for post-op pain management um, and how to uh, manage your Suboxone that you might be on prior to surgery um, so that you don't have um, uncontrollable pain and that the care team knows that you might need a higher, higher dose of a pain medication because you have that built up tolerance. All right, so I am gonna go a little bit more into detail about the individual medications. And as a pharmacist, this is what I um, get really excited about. <laughs> uh, and, but before we talk about the specific medications, I just wanted to provide a very general overview of addiction and how um, substances affect your brain and what's happening. So um, when you consume a substance, your, your brain sees it as a, re a, a reward and there's a dopamine release. Um, and then your brain remembers that. It remembers the good feelings that you had um, and then it starts to think it, it wants more of that. And your brain starts to think that you need that in order to survive. Um, there's also different parts of your brain that start to correlate that with the settings that you're in, the people that you're around, um, and, and our, our brains are trained to take the, the path of least resistance or, or what's the easiest route. Um, so, you know, if you have an option of 
taking a substance or going through withdrawal, it's really hard to overcome that step of doing the harder thing. Um, and and as we continue to, as you continue to take substances, your brain just starts to need more and more of that. And again, it starts to think that you need that in order to survive. Um, so in the MAC clinic, the clinicians will do an assessment to determine if, if the individual has a substance use disorder. Um, we know that as patients take opioids, they build up a tolerance and a dependence, but that doesn't necessarily mean that you have a substance use disorder. Um, so the criteria that's used is the DSM-5, which is the gold standard for all diagnosis of mental illness. Um, this chart just kind of shows some of the different patterns that, that are assessed to determine if um, a patient has a substance use disorder. We have some data on the risks of um, death after an overdose. So after um, an individual experiences their first non-fatal overdose, the risk of death is 18% in, the, in five years. That's, that's really high. Um, and we know that that first year after an overdose is a really critical time period um, and that the risk of death is 9.4%, so almost 10%. So getting individuals into treatment um, after that first non-fatal overdose is very important. Um, but on the, on the good side, we do have treatment um, and we do have good data on patients staying in treatment. Um, so for those that are on medications for opioid use disorder, um, data shows that after 24 weeks, we have about 60 to 74 percent of individuals that are still in treatment. Um, the medication, so buprenorphine and naltrexone or suboxone, um, which we'll talk about a little bit more in a minute, are protective against overdose and they help to reduce cravings. Um, naltrexone, we do have medication that's just naltrexone by itself. Unfortunately, that one has a higher rate of failure um, because it does require individuals to completely detox before starting. Um, and so then they have to go through the withdrawal and the negative effects. Um, so we don't see as, as great of um, retention with that specific treatment. And we typically use it for alcohol, which I'll talk about more. So talking about um, some of the different medications that are used for opioid use disorder specifically, uh, we have buprenorphine, and that comes in a couple different formulations. So suboxone is the primary um, formulation that we use in the clinic. That's the sub, it's a sublingual film. Um, there's also Subutex, which is a pill, and then Sublocade, which is a long-acting injection. Um, so once patients have been compliant and started on Suboxone, they can transition to a once-monthly injection, which really helps with compliance. Um, now, Trexone is typically, um, like I said, more often used for alcohol use disorder. Um, and Vivitrol is what we primarily use in the MAC clinic, and that is a, also a long-acting injection, so it's a once-monthly injection. And then methadone, uh, methadone we don't use at the MAC clinic. Um, and if you've heard of methadone clinics before, um, those are very highly regulated because they do have, methadone does have the risk of overdose and um, abuse potential. So those are the clinics where patients typically have to go every day to get their dose. They take it there. Um, so there's a lot of parameters and control over that, um, but we, we don't have to do that with Suboxone because it doesn't have the risk of overdose um, and have some of those additional safety risks. All right, and then this picture over here shows how the different substances work on an opioid receptor. So methadone is a full opioid agonist, uh, meaning that it's, it's, it's works on the opioid receptors like an oxycodone or a fentanyl will, would. Um, buprenorphine, which is in Suboxone, is a partial agonist. Um, so what that means is it doesn't fully activate those opioid receptors. Um, so it activates it enough to help prevent cravings and those withdrawal symptoms, 
but it doesn't fully activate it to where you get that euphoria or that high or that respiratory depression. Um, and then naltrexone is the antagonist, so it completely blocks um, a substance from activating that receptor. Um, so that's, and we'll talk about that a little bit more in the next slide too. So again, this is just kind of a similar picture. So you can see the full opioid like heroin or pain medications, um, and then a depiction of the partial opioid agonist, which is Suboxone. Um, and then Narcan or Naloxone um, has a very strong affinity or it's, it's very highly attracted to those opioid receptors. And then when it binds, it binds really tightly. And so it'll displace an opioid that's bound to that receptor. So that's why it works for overdose because if you have fentanyl or um, oxy that is attached to those receptors, the Narcan will, dis will remove it and reverse the um, effects, so that respiratory depression. Um, in addition to the Suboxone um, or other agents, we use some other commonly used medications to just help with other withdrawal symptoms. Um, we use Ondansetron or Zofran for nausea, uh, we, we have other medications to help with symptoms of anxiety or diarrhea is a common side effect of withdrawal or adverse effect of withdrawal. Um, so these, these medications are commonly used for different, different indications as, or different needs as well. Um, and so we will use those in, con in conjunction with the um, Suboxone. And then I'm just going to touch a little bit on medications that we use for alcohol use disorder. Uh, again, we have naltrexone, which I mentioned before. We have acamprosate and disulfram. Um, these have been around for a very long time. And there is pretty good data on how, how effective they are. So I'll kind of break, break this data down a little bit. Um, so acamprosate, we have quite a few trials or, and research that's been done on its use. Um, num that NNT in that middle column, that stands for number needed to treat. And that's a, a number that we look at to see, okay, how many individuals do we need to treat to prevent one person from returning to drinking? And so the studies show that we need to treat 12 people with a camprosate to prevent one person from returning to drinking. Um, to kind of see how that looks in comparison to some other medications that are used. So warfarin, um, which is a blood thinner medication used to prevent stroke, um, the data for that medication shows that we need to treat 25 people to prevent one person from having a stroke. Over what period of time? Well, is that, that's a good question. Um, I'm not sure on that, but I can, I can follow up. Um, and then, let's see here, buprenorphine, so that medication that's in, in Suboxone, um, treating one out of two people will, uh, the data show, recent data shows that having somebody stay in treatment, um, the number that you need to treat is two. So again, really, really good data on retention um, in treatment for, the, for Suboxone. And then, now, Trexone um, also has pretty good data to show that it helps to prevent returning to any drinking um, and then also prevent, prevent return to heavy drinking. Um, we don't have that data for a camprosate just based on what, what research has been done. So. Just to reiterate that warfarin, yep. you have to treat 25 people to uh, prevent stroke in one mm -hmm. or have success with one? Yep. Yeah. Understand yeah, I can I, I, I can go over that a little bit more. Um, so that's a, a, a measure that is used in um, studies that's done to look at the effectiveness of the medication. Um, and so we hope that it's going to have a higher high rate of effectiveness, right? Um, but there's a lot of different factors that go into how effective medications are. And some of those are patient specific. So, you know, we, each individual um, responds to medications differently. And, and, you know, you might see like 
one person has a side effect from a medication and another person doesn't. So each individual is different in how they respond to medications. Um, and so that's why sometimes we see it might not work for this person, but it works for another person. Um, so, so that data point just helps us see in, in a large population of people, um, how many people is this effective for? Well, would you consider warfarin, warfarin a successful uh, treatment for Prevent stroke, stroke. stroke prevention, yes, absolutely. And so, um, and what I, I could have included in here is maybe some medications that have quite a bit higher number needed to treat. Um, so, and I'm trying to think of one off the top of my head, but you know, some medi we, we hope that, um, again, medications are effective for everybody, but that's just not the case. So, um, but I, I think, um, these numbers that I have here are very low, low numbers. So yes, these are effective medications. Um, you know, with warfarin, there's a lot that goes into that too because it needs to be monitored and you need to be in, in the, the specific range. Um, and, and you know that there's a lot of foods that affect how effective warfarin is. Um, so again, there's, there's a lot of different factors um, and this is just one uh, data point on, on the effectiveness of these. So people who are advised to take that medication yep. should not feel badly if right. it doesn't work on them and they should report that right away yep. instead of, you know, how does it compare to the placebo? Right. Right. And that's what, um, like for a campersate, the studies, it is comp for the um, alcohol use medications, um, those studies are compared to placebo. Um, so that shows that, you know, it, it does, ha it is an effective medication. So. by doctors, yep. but it's not, the prescription itself isn't needed for people right. to take it. So I suppose there's no way to track how effective that is. No, th there has been studies done on that, um, and it's, it's, it's changed over the years of what our, um, uh, especially as more data has become available on, on the effectiveness of low-dose aspirin. Um, and that might be another good topic that we could talk about at some point too. Um, but we'll, we'll continue through this and then maybe we can chat more about the anticoagulants um, and stroke prevention um, afterwards because I think that's, that's a good topic as well. So uh, in the MAT clinic, um, when patients start in our program, um, it does require frequent visits at the start. Um, and, and that's because a lot of times patients that are starting treatment, they're very vulnerable. And it is a very vulnerable state that they're in and, and they need that frequent um, reinforcement. So we do have patients start with weekly visits initially. Um, so they, they come into the clinic and they start the medication actually in the clinic. Um, and then they will, we'll, we follow up with them the next day, see how they're doing. Um, and then they come in weekly for about a month. Um, and then we start to move those visits out to bi-weekly and then um, out to monthly. Uh, we do a urine drug screen at each visit. Um, and for, depending on which medication they're on um, is how we, like if they're on the monthly injections, then they come in monthly. Um, the injections that we do are given in clinic, so it's not something that, you know, like insulin that you can give at home. You have to come into the clinic for the injection. Um, and then we, um, when we start patients on treatment for alcohol use disorder, um, they typically come in weekly for the first couple weeks and then um, monthly after that. So one of the things um, is that you know, we don't necessarily have many of these treatment options within Goodhue County. Um, you are having to go to Rochester or the Twin Cities. Um, but I think OMC and, and one of our goals is to see how we can maybe reach out to um, the other communities that we serve. So Cannon Falls being one of them um, to see how we can um, have that access to care for people in Cannon Falls or, or the smaller areas without having to come to Rochester. Um, 
And I'll talk more about that in a minute too. So one of the things I just wanted to highlight is that, you know, it takes a village. Um, we work very closely with probation officers, um, social services, you know, we try to address those other needs that, that individuals have in order to be able to be successful. So having housing, having food, um, having transportation. Transportation is a big um, barrier to treatment because individuals don't have a way to get to the clinic. Um, so being able to work together to be able to provide those other resources helps um, individuals to be more successful in, in treatment. Um, from that Goodhue County Needs Assessment on the opioid crisis, um, one of the things that was done was interviews with uh, individuals with um, lived experience um, or who have experienced substance use disorder. Um, and one of the comments was that many of the community members stated that incarceration or law enforcement intervention um, and court orders was ultimately what helps them to get sober. Um, so again, having those collaborations with law enforcement um, and making those connections for how we can get individuals into treatment, um, that makes a big impact. And that is coming from those who experience substance use disorder. I don't know why it's not going to the next slide. Okay. Um, and then just quickly wanted to do an overview of how we approach having conversations with patients. Um, there's a lot of stigma around substance use and seeking treatment. So um, we use motivational interviewing, um, which is actually a um, tactic that I learned in pharmacy school and, and practice talking to patients about with diabetes. Um, and, and we, so we use that same um, tactic to talk to people, talk to patients about substance use. So really having a goal-oriented goal communication, um, having specific goals and talking to patients about what their motivation is. Um, being, expressing empathy, um, you know, being non-confrontational um, and really advocating for uh, self-efficacy and, and autonomy. So um, a lot of times we listen to the patients um, and they, and that just building that rapport and that relationship with individuals so that they trust you takes a long time, um, but then once, once you have that, you can really make progress in whatever goals you have, whether it's lifestyle changes for your diet or um, for substance use. And then, again, this is a topic that you hear about in the news a lot, um, and there's been a lot of recent legislative changes as well. Um, so one of the things is Narcan or Naloxone. Um, that has been approved to be an over-the-counter medication, meaning you will start to see it on the shelves, at the grocery store, at pharmacies. Um, you will not need a prescription in order to get Narcan. Um, this was just recently approved, I think it last Janu January. So manufacturers are still working to produce and label, um, do all the labeling requirements for um, over-the-counter Narcan. Um, but the goal is to try to reduce those barriers um, so that you don't have to go get a prescription from your clinician or your pharmacist, that you can just buy it um, off the shelf and have it available. Um, even if you, you, know, you don't have a substance use disorder, but you might know somebody who does, or um, you know, if, if you've had a surgery and you have opioids at home, maybe you wanna have it on hand. Um, so reducing those barriers to access to naloxone um, to prevent an overdose death. Telehealth, so maybe one of the good things that came out of the pandemic was we had to adapt and figure out how we can still provide care. Um, and so we, we now have telehealth available as an option. Um, and that is something that we use in the MAT clinic. So once, again, once patients have showed that they're committed and they're compliant with treatment, um, you know, if you're located in Stewartville, we, we'd be able to do a telehealth visit. Um, as you know, we still require that you do your urine drug screen, but you can drop that off at the clinic in your area, um, and then we'll, we'll do your visit with you um, virtually. 
removal of the X waiver. So that is a um, required certification for providers to be able to prescribe Suboxone. Um, it was required for physician or for um, advanced practice clinicians and doctors to have this specific certification saying that they can prescribe Suboxone. Um, and, but what we're seeing now is that new providers um, get that training in school, um, so they don't necessarily need to do additional training in order to prescribe Suboxone. Um, and again, removing those barriers. So now, now that they've removed the, that requirement, provi more providers can prescribe Suboxone. Um, so one of our goals within the MAT clinic is we have our specialist team that um, starts patients on treatment and then once you're stable, once you're, you've, you're stable, compliant, um, and if your primary care provider is comfortable, we can transition you back to your primary care provider and they can continue your treatment for you. Um, there's also been a requirement for, um, NARC or for schools and other mandated groups to carry Narcan. Um, and then also additional training for all prescribers. So anybody that has a DEA license, so a license to be able to prescribe controlled substances, has to do eight hours of training on substance use, opioid, um, opioid prescribing, and so that um, is, is new as well. So any, and the, the intent of that is to have more um, providers trained in um, appropriate prescribing of opioids and substance use potential. Um, I just wanted to have a list of some of the local chemi chemical dependency treatment programs um, in the area and these are some of the ones that the MAT clinic um, works with either it, if we do an assessment on a patient and, and don't think that uh, maybe that they need a higher level of care, meaning they might need like an inpatient treatment, um, we'll work to make referrals and try to get patients into treatment. Um, let's see, and I, I mentioned that we do a lot of work with different committees and organizations within Olmstead County. Um, I know one of the goals specifically for the MAT clinic, again, is to see how we can reach some of those other um, areas, um, our branch clinics that we, that we have, um, and continuing to provide education. Um, I also lead our opioid stewardship group at Olmstead Medical Center. So I, um, and I have it here too, I developed um, education about naloxone, education about um, opioids and the risks. Um, I, I work with our providers on providing updates on um, best practice for prescribing opioids. Um, you know, our, our, per, our understanding and our knowledge about pain and opioids in general has just has grown so much um, over the years. And there's a lot of new information. So um, we work to try to continue to provide education and knowledge about that. And then um, if you have any questions for me, I'll stick around for a little bit. Um, I do have some other resources up front here too um, I, that I can kind of go through. Um, we have our MAT Clinic treatment resource manual, um, just an overview of the MAT Clinic. And if you have time to read it, um, I do have a story. Um, our chief operations officer uh, happened to be picking up a prescription and overheard a conversation of a couple of the MAT Clinic patients um, talking about the difference that the MAT Clinic has made in their life. Um, you know, they've been able to get a job, they have their family back, they, you know, they have relationships with more of their family. Um, and it was just him observing this interaction between individuals and, and what a difference um, being in the MAT Clinic has made. So I know that was a lot of information. Thank you for your time and let me know if you have any questions. Yeah. To test the potency. Yeah. Uh, I thought it would be really neat if I would let get one. Sure. Leave it laying around the house when my children come to visit, and they'll say, "Mom, should we know about this?" <laughs> yeah. And and so this is something that I I do a lot of education with uh, on like, well, why when would we use a fentanyl test strip and. Um, um, so again, you know, the goal would be that we're not using substances. 
but um, you know, some people just aren't at that point. And if we can prevent a death, maybe we can get them into treatment. Um, so a lot of those nonprofit organizations, um, which I think I may have on my next slide too here. Um, so this uh, website here, Overdose, Opioid Overdose Prevention, which is just from the Minnesota Department of Health, has a lot of resources on where you can get naloxone, fentanyl test strips. That's where I saw that you could get the xylazine test strips. Um, so the way we use fentanyl test strips, um, we actually got them through a grant. Um, so if we have patients that have uh, maybe come to the MAT clinic after an ER visit for an uh, overdose, um, we'll, we'll, ask, we'll ask them if they would like fentanyl test strips. Um, they, there's instructions on how to use them right here. You can also go and watch a video on how to use it. There's, um, it but essentially they just either um, dissolve part of whatever substance they're going to use um, and then they dip it in there and, and see if it's positive or not for fentanyl. Um, and then I did bring um, just one of the examples of Narcan. Um, just again, because this is going to be available on the, over the counter um, now. And um, let's see, what else did we have here? Yeah, what other questions do you just have? Just thought only law enforcement was supposed to have Narcan. No, anybody can now. Really? Yep. Yeah. So um, any. It's really been a lifesaver, has it? Yes. Been? Yep. Um, so. Prior to it being approved to be available over the counter, you did have to have a prescription for it, but anybody could get a prescription. So you could, um, and we actually, in Minnesota, pharmacists are actually able to prescribe Narcan. Um, so you could go to your pharmacy, a lot of them have protocols to say, okay, yep, I'm gonna write Natalie a prescription for Narcan and dispense it. Um, but now that's not gonna be necessary. Um, it will just be available over the counter, so. Does law enforcement carry Narcan? Yeah. yeah. Good. Yep. So um, I participated in a career fair last spring, and I brought um, just some random things just to kind of get kids' interest um, to stop and talk to me about careers in pharmacy. And one of the things I brought was naloxone, and I just kind of was like, "Do you know what naloxone is used for?" And most of them knew. Yeah. You know, like, yep, that's if it's if if there's an overdose. Um, and at that point, I had kind of started talking to uh, the superintendent about, you know, do we have Narcan in the schools? Um, and then it was shortly after that that the legislator, legislature actually mandated that, um, n that Narcan be available in the schools. So I don't know, you know, what the timeline is for them to actually have that available, but um, I, I know that that will be a requirement that it's in the schools. Is your clinic in Olmsted Hospital? So, and I'm sorry I didn't mention that. Um, so it is in Rochester. In Rochester, we have the hospital location and then we have two clinics. Um, so the MAT clinic is actually located at our Southeast clinic. Um, so on the south end of town, um, kind of by where the old Kmart is, if, or the, the corn cob water tower, if you're familiar with that. Um, and so that's where we have, have patients go, is the Southeast clinic. You were going to say something else about the 81 milligram. Yeah. Um, Stroke prevention. Yeah. yeah. Um, that's a good question. You know, and so there's a lot. Um, let's see. I feel like that's a whole topic in itself <laughs> um, as far as, you know, if you're taking it just if you've never had a stroke before and you feel like you need to take aspirin um, or if you've had a stroke, um, that's, and, and, it's, and now you need to be on something for prevention. Um, we also typically see its use after patients have had like knee or hip surgery. Um, they go on a low dose aspirin um, after surgery to help prevent um, a blood clot. Um, so I think the question has been like, well, does everybody need to take a low dose aspirin or not? Um, but there are some risks with taking aspirin as well. You know, it can, it can be hard on your stomach and, and um, potentially cause a bleed in your stomach. So, um, yeah, so we, you know, I, I definitely think there is data to support that it, it is effective against pre preventing stroke, um, but it depends on how, what your risk is. Um, you know, if you have 
other factors that are um, increasing your risk for having a stroke, like if you have um, atrial fibril, atri atrial fibril, fibril fib yeah. AFib, yeah. there we go, <laughs> AFib, um, that you're at higher risk. So um, I think that's where it kind of comes down to like a, a pa patient specific question, but. Okay, so a lot of this data and everything is, is addressing those who are already yeah. <coughs> With this money gland, is there going to be a certain amount, percentage appropriated to actually prevention of somebody going in down that dark yeah. road? Yeah. And, you know, does it start, I mean, I hate to say where it starts, if somebody is born with, you know, just kind of a, a gene that leads mm -hmm. them to easier addiction than a brother or sister. Yep. Um, so, you know, is that prevention start in preschool, kindergarten? Right, right, and that's I mean, a good question. Not the home, obviously, but there are right. parents who are addicted who wouldn't be up to that job, or people that just, they just don't have that sort of mm -hmm. training or knowledge. So what about prevention? Yep. Um, so I can uh, talk a little bit about how I know Olmstead County is working with those funds. Um, and Goodhue County, they just finished this assessment on like what the needs are. And so the next steps will be what are, what are we going to do about it? I, you know, I'm sure there will be parts about prevention. Um, but I work with the, the group within Olmstead County that's using these funds. Um, and there's kind of a couple different groups that are working on it. So, but prevention is one of the big things and it is focused on the youth. Um, so we, we work with, uh, Rochester Public Schools actually now has um, drug and alcohol counselors within the schools. Um, and then we are um, planning to do a virtual, um, virtual community meeting in March, I believe to talk about prevention strategies, um, what is evidence-based, like what does research show that's worked, um, having families involved is a huge part of that. Um, and the, the audience for that virtual meeting is families, um, parents, community members, um, professionals, um, to talk about youth prevention. Um, and then there are some, um, other programs that we're like evaluating to see um, if we would recommend that those be in the schools um, and and so for Olmstead County that's definitely a big focus um, is that prevention piece and I think I, I think that that will also be part of Goodhue County's um, yeah Yep. Program. Yeah. Yep. And they were doing all of that back way back then. Yeah. That was supposed to prevent kids from going getting into drugs. Right. It didn't seem to work. Right. So you talk about all this prevention. Mm -hmm. But I mean, we should have had a population that was kind of inoculated against that. Right. And doesn't appear that we do. Right. Yeah, and um, I feel like I, we can't talk about substance use disorder without talking about mental health as well, um, because a lot of times it's there's there's both aspects of um, mental health disorders and substance use, um, and so I think that's one of the. the that has been one identified as one of the other gaps in care or or needed resources is mental health services. Um, so uh, like with um, substance use treatment, like we, we try to, we get patients into psych to have either their, or counseling, um, other behavioral therapies to help address those things because a lot of times, you know, you have to take that whole patient approach of, of addressing all the different factors that are impacting their, if they're using drugs or not. Um, you know, a lot of people that have trauma um, and, and finding um, healthy ways to cope with those things um, and, and teaching them and having those treatments on board as well. I would guess too that there is a certain kind of addictive person profile. I could be wrong about that, but I think I read that. Somewhere. 
Yeah, no, there's definitely factors that increase your risk um, for having um, addiction or a substance use disorder. Um, and, you know, having family members that have um, had, or that genetic component of addiction, um, having trauma, childhood trauma, um, having um, other substance use disorders as well, then you're more likely to have another substance use disorder. So there are factors that increase your risk, definitely. That's a, the question I wanted to continue on is that in my high school days, alcohol was the drug of choice. Yep. What changed? And I, I mean, we still see that alcohol, I mean, the, um, you know, with our data that we have is we still see that alcohol is an issue. Um, but it, I think it depends, kind of like you mentioned with the D.A.R.E. program, it's, you know, what are we focusing on? Um, you know, and it, it just, it's a, it ebbs and flows of, of what's available, what's the drug of choice, what's in our community. Um, you know, vaping has been a, a, a large topic, um, and we've, we don't currently have a lot of data on the risks of vaping. I think that's kind of what we're starting to see, too. Um, and, and some of the student survey data, too, um, the perception of students and, like, the harm that can come from marijuana and vaping, they, they, don't, the, they don't think that there's a risk for that. Um, so that's kind of where we need to get back to that education and prevention of what are your potential risks. Um, yeah. Has there been studies with children who have ADHD taking that medication and being more likely to be addicted to drugs? Um, I think, so if they have a, like a diagnosis that requires that medication, I don't know if there's studies for that. Um, but with Olmstead County and our um, substance use data, we've, we've actually seen stimu stimulants, so the drugs that are used for ADHD, um, stimulant-related deaths have increased. Um, and so how, how does that cause death? Is it, it can cause a heart attack. Um, so, and you have you know, people that are um, maybe prescribed a stimulant medication and then they become dependent on that, and then methamphetamine is also a stimulant, um, and so that's kind of how those are related. Um, so that that has been an increase, at least within Olmstead County. You were talking about prevention mm -hmm. tactics, yep. and it, you know, check me 100% if I'm wrong. It seems to me that prevention type tactics are geared to the person is probably a very small percentage that are willing to listen as versus those that say, well, it would never happen to me right. anyway. Right. Uh, yeah, and you know, I, I think um, w one of our main goals is just more awareness and more education and like, you know, me being in the medical community, I see it a lot or like I have conversations yesterday I was just having a conversation with one of our uh, physicians about opioid prescribing you know and and how how it's changed um, and so but I think one of our goals now and one of our focuses is having more um, presentations or meeting with different members of the community like in this setting uh, meeting with law enforcement meeting with um, schools just to have more awareness because more awareness. yes yes and then you know I, I mentioned there's a lot of stigma or like that you know shame of seeking treatment and and um, but hopefully that by understanding you know how the medications work um, and there's some thought that well if you're on suboxone you're not really sober right because um, it is still a partial opioid right um, but it we really want to try to reduce that stigma for treatment because if if the if our if one of the options is you're on suboxone or you're doing fentanyl um, your risk of death and and more se serious side effects is a lot greater with fentanyl um, you know and and if you're on suboxone you you can't overdose on suboxone i mean i'm going to say you can't um, 
any overdose death that we have had where Suboxone has been involved, there's also been other substances on board. Um, so, you know, having, as I mentioned, you know, having people on Suboxone might help them to start counseling, get a job, be able to do some of these other activities that just help them to be healthier. So, um, and then I was just gonna say, we also then try to connect them with primary care to help address any of their other health needs. Um, yeah. You spoke about the different effects that various uh, drugs can have on different people. Mm -hmm. uh, Laura came home from the hospital from a surgery with 90 oxycodone mm -hmm. pills. And after several days, I don't remember the rate anymore, but it, I, it was time for another one. And I said, how are you doing? How's your pain? I don't have any. Yeah. It was less than 10 minutes. She said, when do I get the next one? It was already, when you talked about brain right. things, it was right. already starting that. And I said, I think we need to have a little discussion as right. we go along here. And yeah. I told her what I'd been noticing. Yep. And she said, okay, the next day she said, I already know why I was feeling so goofy, I think is the word she's mm -hmm. used after a few days of those. Mm -hmm. um, she said, I will not take right. any more of that. Right. I said, what are you going to do when it hurts? Well, then you went to <coughs> Tylenol or uh, yeah, ibuprofen. Yeah, Tylenol plus. Yep. But how sneaky those darn drugs are. <laughs> yeah. Um, and, and she was prescribed 90. That's yeah. a lot. That is, yeah. yeah. Now tell them the rest of the story. 90 <laughs> for 14 bucks, I mean, what a deal. <laughs> <laughs> you can tell the rest of it. Well, we're in the jail in, in, Ridge, in uh, Red Wing, and I don't know how we got to, oh, a kid was in there for, he'd been doing some drugs. And, yeah. And then he'd been selling some drugs. And, and for some reason or other, we talked to that story with him, and he said, do you realize what you could have got on the street? Oh, for, for, that, right. for that little bottle? Right. Um, with, so, and that's been something that's changed with like our opioid yes. prescribing practices, is yes. like now we have better data to say like, okay, you had your knee replaced, this is, you need a, seven day prescription of an opioid because that's when you're going to be in that acute pain phase. Um, and so really limiting the amount of, and um, there, and I didn't have this because again, there's only so much you can include, but the rate of opioid prescriptions has continued to decrease um, since I think 2016 is when we have the data. So even though we're not prescribing opioids as frequently, we're still having overdose deaths. Um, and that's, again, um, it changes of what the drug of choice is. You know, we went from heroin um, to fentanyl is now the primary um, substance that we're finding in the community. So um, I think even though we have done better with our opioid prescribing, we're, s we're still having um, overdose deaths. Um, she could have been hard to get along with if, if she would have stayed with the I want one because right. I need it. <laughs> yeah. And, she didn't do and and I was going to mention too. So that's um, you know having those conversations with patients before they have surgery about which they did. Not you know that time. you're you're going to have pain. You're having surgery. You're going to have pain. And, and the expectation isn't that you're not going to have any pain by taking this. But do you is it managed enough that you can be comfortable or like continue with your daily activities? Um, so I think just that. Uh, um, what the expectation is in that transition from we want to relieve all your pain to I want you to be able to get through your day um, and still be able to do the activities that you enjoy um, but you might still have a little pain so I find it very frustrating though because I've had lots of surgeries and I find it very frustrating that they won't give you what you know works for your mm -hmm. body Yep. Or Percocet, I immediately go off my back. Yeah. I can't function. Yeah. Can't walk hardly. But mention, and I can't think of the name. It's the it's the drug that's just under hydrocodone. No. No. It's just I think it starts with M. Morphine. 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 You mentioned morphine, and 
they get all rattled. Oh, we can't give you more for this. Mm -hmm. But that's what works for me. Yeah. Yeah. And I get very frustrated that they won't give me what works. I mean, they can certainly limit it. Mm -hmm. and, and allow only so many days or whatever. But right. Yeah, and that's and that was kind of the conversation I had yesterday with one of our physicians. Is and um, he's you know a newer physician. I mean, he probably uh, I think he's been at OMC for a couple of years now. Um, and he said, well, when I was in medical school, it was always a trick trick question if we give opioids or not, like because the um, the perception you know went from you give everybody opioids to you don't give anybody opioids. And so now we're trying to find this middle ground of um, who is it appropriate for and, and what are those um, needs where you, you like cancer pain and, and those, those needs where, you, where an opioid is appropriate. Um, and so I think for providers, there's, you know, there's so much pressure to, uh, to not prescribe opioids or to, um, like they, they just, because they're, watch, they're watched by like the state on how many opioids they're prescribing, so they feel a lot of pressure. And so I think that's where you see some hesitancy. But, but yeah, yeah. I don't know after knee replacement. <laughs> no, no, yeah. <laughs> and that's what, I, that's what I ended up with because they would not. Yeah. Thank you guys. Prescribe opioids. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. I wasn't asking to be on it for two months. Right. And Natalie said she could stay a yeah. little bit. Yeah. So you continue can. your questions. They're good questions. I wanted to check with you. Anything you want to? We always love hearing from law yeah. enforcement. We try to keep it on a platonic level here. So, but we do like hearing from you. Anything we should know about? Um, or just we're just curious about that. We shouldn't know about. That's what we really. <laughs> want to know. Um, I have nothing to add so far. But if anyone has questions, I can do my best. Yeah. Oh, but I know I was wondering if you knew why the drug of choice changed well, from, uh, probably from TV to just powerful. access? A lot yeah. of the stuff that's available now was not available then. Right. Why wasn't it available? Just I mean, it was on the planet. Well, like you know, prescription medication, yeah. like stuff like that. Yeah. Like oh, really? So and like and synthetic all. opioids, which are the ones that are made in essentially a lab, you know, those are the oh, ones that we... Sure that are newer, right? Okay. Versus like morphine is a very mm -hmm. long time used yeah. medication, but fentanyl is relatively new. And so that's just, oh, yeah. you know, that's why. And then people figure out how to change them just a little bit. Um, I, I, when I was in pharmacy school, I actually went to the, um, and it's the lab testing up in, up in the cities and they do all like the urine drug screen testing um, and got to see like, how their equipment works and how it identifies the substances and um, you know they run the chemical analysis but people are smart Ch chemists are smart and they figure out how to change uh, a substance just a little bit so that it can't be detected but you still get the same effects and um, so yeah for your right right and that's yeah what and like with the xylazine like that's a new new substance um, Kratom was another one that we've seen um, that is, has um, been in the area and, and we didn't have that before. And so just, they weren't available and now they are. <laughs> Thank you very much. Yes. Okay, appreciate Yeah, I hope, it was, I hope it was good information. I know it can be kind of dense going through some of those things, but um, I enjoy talking about it. So. Well, like I said, I like seeing how, you know, the, the different substances work on the brain and, and the chemical structures and things like that, but I know that can bore some people. <laughs> so thank you for paying attention and, and listening. And, yeah. uh,